In the last 20 years, we've developed the tools like biofeedback monitors to see what's happening to your, um, your nervous system when you do this. And then in the last 10 years with the Human Genome Project, we developed the ability to look into the genes that have been turned on and turned off and see what's happening with your genes. So for example, the genes that are responsible for the blueprints for building stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline shut down. We're breathing, we're relaxed. Our tongue's on the floor of your mouth. You'll find if you're ever angry, if you're ever mad at somebody, let your tongue be on the floor of your mouth. It's impossible to stay mad. <laughs> Try staying mad at somebody with your tongue relaxed. <laughs> you can't do it. So it's just a simple mechanical thing. Just, if you just do that, it tells your body you're safe, relax. And that's the crucial thing about EFT. We carry traumas and griefs and stresses with us all through our lives. They start getting laid down very early. I, I ask, get asked often, what causes a big emotional trauma? What's the, what are the roots of things like post-traumatic stress disorder? And what happened in a person's childhood? Well, often uh, it'll be something horrendous in, in the person's childhood. It could be um, being abused by a parent or by a relative. It could be um, terrible feelings of separation or abandonment. But sometimes, for example, one guy that we worked with, it turned out his trauma, one trauma from his childhood was that when his father was putting him in his crib one day when he was about six months old, his father put him in his crib and misjudged the distance and dropped him a few inches. And this became a major life trauma for this person 50 years later. And who'd have thought that something that would seem so, so small can so traumatize us. So sometimes it's things that we think are very, very small. Other times, why, for example, we know that we have troops coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq with PTSD, and it's a terrible problem. But it's intriguing that about two-thirds of them come back from combat without PTSD. So why do those two-thirds not have PTSD? Why are those two-thirds so resilient, but one-third can develop PTSD later on? We wonder what, 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 what triggers those traumas. So EFT and relaxation and heart breathing and all these things, just tell your body you're safe. And what we'll be doing throughout the course of these two days is telling ourselves over and over and over again in various ways we're safe. Not telling ourselves with our minds because if I walk up to you and you feel uncomfortable and I say, don't worry, well, maybe you'll buy it. Okay, but often just the verbal part of our communications is not that effective because the part of us that gets traumatized is not the verbal part. It's the pre-verbal parts of our brains. It's our mid-brains and it's our hind-brains. You'll hear me talk, talk over and over and over again about this, these three parts of the brain, the triune brain theory. And one humorous way of looking at this, so one way to remember it, is that these brains were developed over the course of millions of years of evolution gradually. So the brain stem and the back of the brain, the hind brain, is our reptilian brain. Dinosaurs had those brains. Snakes and lizards today have those brains. Crocodiles have those brains. So think of this as your inner crocodile. <laughs> You've got this crocodile in the back there. It ends about here and then it goes down. And it is fabulously good at one thing, and that's survival. It is so good at survival. It makes sure if you're thirsty, you drink. It makes sure when you're hungry, you eat. It makes sure that when you need sleep, you get sleep. It takes care of you. When there's danger, it gets you out of the way or it, it jumps up and defends you. Really, really good. And this, this part of your brain is roughly 3.4 billion years old. A very, very old part of your brain. So that's your inner crocodile back there, okay? And the drawback is, you can say to the inner crocodile, calm down, there's no, no, no real problem here. And it doesn't hear you because it has no language. It's not uh, wired for language at all. It's superbly good at scanning the environment about four million times per second. It's taking about, in about four million bits of data per second. It's scanning the environment for threats and it's ready to act on any threat to your survival. 
So that's the old part of the brain. And on top of that, we have this midbrain, the middle part of our brain. And that is something that came into being with, uh, with mammals. And then on top of that layer is our big frontal lobes, which is the thinking part of the cognitive part of your brain. So, for example, your dog and your cat have a midbrain. They have those midbrain structures and a little, little bit of forebrain as well. And your midbrain has to do with things like feelings. If you look into the eye of a snake, you don't see a warm, fuzzy, <laughs> relational being there, just this reptilian eye glaring at you. But if you look in the eye of a dog or a horse, you know, there's really a, something there you can relate to emotionally. You don't tend to have a deep emotional relationship with a lizard. <laughs> but you can have one with a dog or a cat or creatures that have that, that midbrain structure. So it has to do with, with, with relationship, has to do with emotion. And the trouble with trauma is that when we get emotions encoded, like if you abuse or beat a dog repeatedly, okay, then those emotions get, of trauma get encoded in the dog's midbrain. And then all that survival stuff in the crocodile brain gets activated by, by bad emotional experiences. And that happened to most of us growing up. Again, the dog doesn't have language. Uh, if you, there's a cartoon I saw once of this man saying to his dog, Rover, you were a bad dog. You should not have eaten my shoe. Rover, don't eat shoes again. You're not allowed to eat shoes. And Rover's sitting looking at this monster, he's wagging his tail. And then you see what Rover's hearing. And Rover's hearing, blah, 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 Rover. Blah, 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 Rover. Blah. <laughs> so if you try and convince a traumatized midbrain that you're OK, again, no language there. The language part of your brain is only 100,000 years old. It's, very, it's a very, very recent evolutionary development. It wasn't there with the dinosaurs. It only popped up around the Great Lakes of Africa about 100,000 years ago. And the story of why it popped up there and what happened there is very interesting. I won't tell it today. But um, suddenly there was this massive explosion of brain growth 100,000 years ago with early hominids learning to walk upright, learning to use tools, de developing language, uh, developing s symbolic abilities, developing art. All this enormous shift in evolution occurred very, very recently. If you took a clock and began with the creation of the Earth and you took that whole cycle of evolution and, and reduced it just, just to say 12 hours, okay, then the dinosaurs start um, only around here and die out around there. And we human beings start at something like, um, and if midnight is now, we start at something like 1158. That's where we start on the evolutionary spiral. We're very, very novel and um, recently evolved species. And so we have this, this overlay of these, these cognitive parts of ourselves. So here we, we feel emotional trauma. We've had experiences as children that have hurt us and become encoded as trauma in our midbrain and hindbrain. What we don't have is the ability to talk to those parts and tell them they're safe verbally. Because the safe message only mean, has meaning to your forebrain, to your cognitive abilities, not to those, those back ones. But what does have meaning to them, what has meaning to that traumatized midbrain and hindbrain is touch. If you say, Rover, calm down, and stroke Rover, Rover gets the message that he's safe and there's no threat. If your cat has been traumatized by a dog, if you stroke the cat, then the cat can calm down and quickly get out of its traumatized state. So what EFT is and what letting your tongue settle on the floor of your mouth is and what belly breathing is, is just physiological ways of telling your body you're safe. And so with the tapping we use with EFT, we have people tap in various acupuncture points on their bodies. This tapping just says to your body, oh, there's no real threat, there's no real trauma going on here. You don't have to worry. 
And when reports began coming into me about three or four years ago of coaches and therapists working with veterans coming back from Iraq, and they would say, Dawson, you won't believe this, but I had this veteran show up in my office uh, with high levels of PTSD, flashbacks, nightmares, uh, all kinds of physical problems. I did EFT with them. We did a few hours of EFT and they were fine. They were testing <coughs> negative for PTSD on these PTSD screens. And I'm thinking, wow, can that really be true? But I just got many of these reports from various people. So I began a, a research project to see if this really was true and it really is true that if, that the best of attempts to convince these people who are traumatized that they're safe with the forebrain and telling them they're safe don't work too well. But if you actually just introduce a little bit of physical stimulation, telling Rover you're safe, telling your midbrain you're safe, while you recall the trauma, suddenly the whole body calms down. And this conditioned response loop of remembering a trauma, remembering your childhood trauma, remembering a combat trauma, and going into that tense state you break that cycle, you break that condition response one time and it stays broken. And it's quite remarkable that people can then be talking about the same incident that so traumatized them and triggered them earlier. Now they're talking about the same incident and it's like, okay, it happened and I have perspective on it. I, ha I don't have the same sense of emotional arousal when I think about that trauma. So that's, that's how these very simple mechanical um, interventions work. They combine the best of our cognitive therapies, the best of our exposure therapies, and then add this element of stimulating these acupressure points and that's what really helps us stay calm at all levels. And we'll do tons and tons of EFT tapping over the course of the next couple of days as we experience this ourselves and use it on some of our, our own issues. And you will be amazed that things that have bothered you sometimes for years will just lose their emotional impact. It's quite startling to see how, how fast that can happen.